These dudes have got energy to spare. We're talking guys who beat off four times a day. This is an epicenter of energy, man. But this Stacy they love, she's, she's an illusion. But in the new age, there's no fooling them, no, sir. They won't be tricked by illusions anymore. Oh, oh my God, I can't hold back. Oh, oh God, oh, I'm coming. Oh, oh, yeah! Woo! While it sounds cliche, there really isn't anything quite like Killer7 out there. This was the first Suda51 title to receive a worldwide release. It introduced many players to one of those rare figures in the industry where you know it's one of their creations. Its different approach to movement and navigation, its colorful cast of characters, and a plot full of open-endedness has memorized and confounded fans for years. Even being released during a time frame when larger studios weren't afraid to take risks, it's still a miracle that Killer7 saw release just for how different it is. It's unapologetic in how polarizing it can be. Some love it, some hate it. But over 17 years later, it does stand out in so many ways even during an era when classic titles were released on irregular. So let's dive into the wild world of Suda51 and Killer7. Killer7 was part of the Capcom 5. Ah, uh, the Capcom 5. First, some background on it. Back in the PS2, Xbox, GameCube console war era, Nintendo was pushing for more third-party support, one of those being Capcom. Nintendo and Capcom had a strong relationship back in the NES and SNES era of Nintendo. However, staying with cartridges for the N64 led many third-party developers, including Capcom, to shift development to PlayStation. In late 2002, Capcom held a press conference announcing what we know known as the Capcom 5 five upcoming titles for the GameCube. Those being Resident Evil 4, Beautiful Joe, Piano 3, Dead Phoenix, and Killer7. They were all overseen by Shinji Mikami, who was also directing Piano 3. Now there were some communication issues between Japan and the West with this announcement. The initial announcement seemed to indicate that these would all be GameCube exclusives. However, that was not the case. To clarify, these titles would be first developed for the GameCube, and may receive ports later. All of them except for Resident Evil 4, which is meant to be a GameCube exclusive. Of course, we all know how that turned out. Resident Evil 4 would go on to have more ports and additions than Skyrim, and a remake on the way as of writing. So what about the other four titles? Piano 3 would be the first to release in 2003, and was a sales flop and had mixed reviews. It has gained the following over time, and there were aspects of it that would show up in Vanquish, a future title directed by Shinji Mikami. Piano 3 remained exclusive for the GameCube. Dead Phoenix would never rise from the ashes and was never released. There's not a ton of information on this title. The original announcement said players can freely fly like a bird into a world of epic proportions. It was to be a third-person flight game in the vein of Kid Icarus and Panzer Dragoon. It didn't show up the following E3 after the announcement, and Capcom was very hush about it. From looking up what happened here, it was quietly cancelled by Capcom without an official announcement. Beautiful Joe would release shortly after Piano 3 to very positive reviews, although not huge sales numbers. It would release nearly a year later on the PlayStation 2, and would receive a sequel and a couple of spin-offs. And then there was Killer7, the game that we're looking at today, which released in mid-2005 simultaneously for the GameCube and PS2. At the time, it had divided reviews but gained a cult following, and would be released for PC in 2018. To note, I am playing the GameCube version for this video. Killer7 was a bit of an anomaly to the Capcom 5 in more ways than one. While the other four titles were developed by Capcom Production Studio 4, Killer7 was developed in collaboration with Grasshopper Manufacture. Grasshopper was founded by Goichi Suda, aka Suda51 in the late 90s, who worked at Human Entertainment prior. Suda51 had directed the Silver Case as Grasshopper's first game, as a text-based point-and-click title. Shinji Mikami was a fan of his work and wanted to work with him. He would serve as the executive producer of Killer7 and help with the overall story. This was also Suda51's first game to get a worldwide release instead of just Japan. So he went in with the intention of making a game with a wider appeal, or at least his definition of it. And what a way to make himself known to the Western world with Killer7. Shit. There's more than 14. Those bastards are breeding. 
With that, let's look into how Killer7 plays, starting with its unusual design in regards to movement. It's on rails, but not exactly like an on rail shooter. You move down a set line, but you could turn around and go back, and you could choose what direction to go at a fork in the road. Playing the GameCube version here with a controller holding A is to move forward. Suda51 said to one of his developers to think of the controls like a racing game. Another reason was that Suda51 wanted the game to be accessible to those who were fans of his prior work, those who enjoyed text-based games. Of course, this approach to movement helps Killer7 stand out, one of the many ways it does so. It's interesting to think about had they not gone with this approach and went with something more traditional. How would Killer7 differ if we, the player, had control over the camera? Taking control of the camera away from a player in a third-person title is a rarity, but Killer7 does take advantage of this with its camera shots. This helps give them this larger-than-life feeling, which, considering their abilities, they pretty much are. Killer7 is fairly simplistic and keeps a small scope in regards to its gameplay. While it feels a bit odd at first, I'm surprised that other titles haven't tried building off this foundation in regards to navigation. I can't really think of any, but if you do know, please drop them in the comments below. Even if Killer7 did play more traditional, it would still stand out amongst other titles. But this choice of design really puts it over the edge to make something truly special. I know it sounds like a cliche, but there's really nothing quite like Killer7 out there, and its navigation plays a large part of it. As we make our way through Killer7 on these set paths, we'll come across numerous enemies, those being the Heaven Smile. When creating the Heaven Smile, the design goal was to make them not like a zombie, but also not making them human. I feel that they nailed this goal. Something familiar, at times amusing, but also threatening. They have unique designs and they're memorable for their audio cues, from the laughter to the screams when they explode. <laughs> <laughs> Some are fairly straightforward to kill, while others require more precise shooting or a specific member of the Killer7 to take out. Scanning them will reveal their weak point for a fast kill in blood. Blood being points to spend on powered up shots, healing, and upgrading your stats. Further upgrades will unlock abilities like locking onto their weak point or counterattacks. So who are the Killer7? Who is this motley crew? Who are the Smiths? A vast majority of the time will be spent playing as six of them. Dan Smith, who serves as a versatile character combat-wise. He also gets some time to shine in regards to character development with the plot. Thank you, sir. How you making out? <laughs> I'm getting by. Hey, here's something extra. Kaide Smith is the barefoot lady in the bloody dress. She has the ability to make use of a scope for ranged shots. We can use her blood ability to unlock certain roadblocks. Kevin Smith, who is silent, which I'm guessing is a nod to Silent Bob, tosses knives and can turn invisible. Con Smith, the shorter of the group, can move at great speed and he can get through smaller places. Granted, it's not like the others couldn't just crawl under these. Coyote Smith, our local master of unlocking, can also jump to high places. Mass Smith, a lucha libre, can use a grenade launcher, which acts differently than other weapons. It takes down enemies easier, but it's tough to get those critical hits to get more blood. Garcin Smith is the seventh, who serves more as a handler or a medium, and our protagonist, which becomes more apparent as the game progresses. He does little damage, but he can revive Smiths that they die in battle. This happened very rarely for me in this playthrough, as the game is fairly easy on normal mode. Challenge through combat wasn't the main focus for the team. As mentioned earlier, they wanted to make a game for their fans who their previous works could enjoy. There is also Harmon Smith, the old man in the wheelchair who bears a strong resemblance to old man Neil Young. He is the leader of the Smiths that will briefly control at points, and does have a heavy presence story-wise. Of the Smiths, beyond Garcia and Harmon who get plenty of time to shine cutscenes, Dan gets some focus with a chapter that focuses on something from his past. Mask gets a bit of time to shine in cutscene at points. Lucha Libre is for kids! But you know, you are great with the kids, Masked Man. Children are pure. 
they know who's the strongest. But the rest, there's very little or none at all on that front. Due to scope, they couldn't do other character-centric chapters like Dan gets. I'm not saying that they should have, but it would've been nice to have points where we gotta see more of the other Smiths and cutscenes to flesh them out more. It does help keep a shroud of mystery amongst them, but even just little bits of dialogue would've been nice outside of gameplay. I found myself mostly playing as Dan, Kaide, and Mask. Dan is very versatile in combat, Kaide has the scope, and Mask has the grenade launcher can help in a pinch that deals with stronger heaven smiles. In the end, it makes more sense to focus on just a few characters to upgrade in regards with how much blood you get. In regards to switching characters, it's a quick and stylish process. Considering how often you may be doing so throughout your time in Killer7, it doesn't get frustrating or annoying. <laughs> So initially, Killer7 would only allow you to switch characters at Harmon's room, which serves as a place to save and upgrade, but decided to allow you to change at any time, which I feel was the right choice. If the game was still structured the way that it is now, it would have created more frustrations and backtracking. Having to go back, select a smith, and then unlock a roadblock, and switch back. To have at least some incentive of getting to use all these smiths at various points, the beginning of each chapter won't have all these smiths available for us to use unless we kill a certain amount of Heaven Smiles to awaken them. Heaven Smiles make their way toward us in different ways, but it's nothing too hard to hit their weak points for an instant kill, or at the very least take them down before they reach us. It's a unique setup that works well for what Killer7 is going for, although there are times they could have pushed this approach further. For example, there is one boss where you're fighting a named maze of trailers, trying to get behind them to get a clear shot at their weak point. They could have gone and played more mileage out of something like this in regards to its combat. Otherwise, it's mostly straightforward, and the same goes for most of the boss fights. There are roadblocks and puzzles in our journeys in Killer7. As mentioned earlier, certain smiths will have an ability to get by these roadblocks. There are also points where we'll need to equip the right ring from our inventory to progress further. In regards to the puzzles, most of them are memorize something from another room or down the hall and use elsewhere, instead of needing to think them out. You can also get hints from the man with the mask for an exchange in blood and him mocking you. One quality puzzle is passing all these pictures and then getting a quiz about them in order to progress, which does take some time to get all the details right. And there's also a puzzle in the end stretch with counting robots that gives a little more thought. Else, once again, it's just read something in one room, use that info in another. Which is too bad that they didn't push for more difficult puzzles that take some time to think about. Considering the studio had done point-and-click titles before, it's not like they were a stranger in how to create puzzles. I can't help but think it was a conscious step to make them fairly straightforward to help appeal to a wider audience, which is funny to think about considering how Killer7 is designed. I don't think the lack of puzzles that make you stop to think to be a deal breaker, but more of a missed opportunity. Having a few more puzzles like the one of answering the quiz correctly from the information on pictures would have been in the right direction. Something that doesn't grind the game to a halt, but gives the player some time to pause and hash things through. The game makes it clear that something needs to be done in area, with the shifting of the camera angle and an audio cue. <laughs> And on completion, we're given one of the most pleasant audio cues for success I've heard in the game. On that note, let's talk about the presentation of Killer7. I've said it many times on this channel, but art direction will always triumph long term over graphic fidelity. I can't think of many games that better exemplify this than Killer7. It's instantly recognizable. The cell shaded approach certainly helps, as this was a time frame when that style was prominent. It's funny to look back at titles like The Wind Waker, which had controversy prior to launch with the cell shaded approach, but it's aged like a fine wine. The character designs are distinct and memorable, along with the variety of locations. With the game being in control of the camera while navigating, Killer7 takes full advantage of this in regards to delivering distinctive, stylish shots to help take its presentation to an even higher level. And the music is utterly fantastic. It's a whole mishmash of genres and styles to fit the current scene we're in. These were composed by Masafumi Takada, who has done soundtracks for other games like No More Heroes and God Hand. Here are some of my favorites. So now let's go through some of the highlights of Killer7, so there will be spoilers ahead. To note about the plot of Killer7, well, it's a trip. There's plenty that's easy to miss the meaning of or get confused with what's going on. There's plenty that's open-ended and up to interpretation. You know those YouTube videos where it takes a property and plays clips out of context like Twin Peaks? Yeah, this game is perfect for that. 
去った吐きだめに降り立ち純情可憐な花一輪豚の群れをあやめてくれよヘッドマスターニートガールあやめブラックバーンサバイブWhile there is plenty of plot within Killer7, a sizable portion of the plot was cut from the game itself. However, there are supplemental resources that were made available, that being Hand in Killer7. This book goes into more details about the timeline, along with the characters and parties involved. That said, it's hard to say how accurate it is, and there is some info within it that contradict the events of the game. Some of that even seems intentional. There are some fairly thorough interpretations of the plot of Killer7 from here on YouTube, the long guide on game facts and what things may mean. Check the description if you're interested in reading Hand in Killer7 7 or that plot guide on GameFAQs. For here, I'm going to cover more of the broad strokes of Killer7 as opposed to going too super deep into the meanings and whatnot. But the key aspects of Killer7 mostly revolve around the following. One being this game of chess, both figuratively and literally, between Harmon Smith and Kun Lan. Uh, yes. Like our chess games, you always seem to win. Do you know why? You tell me. Because you're a bad player. <laughs> These two friends and rivals were born back in the 1700s and have battled with each other since over and over. Another key aspect is the conflict between the United States and Japan and all the backdoor politics behind it. Finally, another key aspect of Killer 7 is the story of Garcia and Smith which really ramps up in the later section of the game. Other aspects and topics that are covering Killer7 include terrorism, cults, free will, and a whole lot of silliness. There are few games that get the luxury of having its creator's signature up front and center, and Suda51 has been one of those few who have been given that opportunity. So let's go through these chapters, or targets, as they go by here. Target Zero serves as a tutorial to how Killer7 plays. We'll get introduced to a number of familiar faces that we'll encounter throughout our journey, such as Iwazaru, our friendly servant in a red gimp mask. Depending on what target we're on, his dialogue will vary, but has a certain structure and rhythm to how it begins and how it ends. Travis is another character we'll run into frequently. He'll always be wearing a different tank top and give us some more insight into the plot. Susie, the severed head who gives us rings and uses emoticons to speak with us. It's all very endearing and gives a light-hearted feel to a character who has a pretty dark backstory. <laughs> For each target, we'll navigate these areas, deal with Heaven Smile, roadblocks our team can get through, and solve puzzles. Along the way, we'll collect soul shells, which we'll trade for at these gates. These are odd areas with the bumping music of the rave, and leads to this coliseum. Here we'll deal with a new Heaven Smile. This will either introduce ones that we'll face in the future, or sometimes it's a one-time fight. Usually this ends with a boss fight, or some kind of narrative encounter before moving on to the next part of the target, or the next target altogether. Which Killer7 has a rhythm in between targets. We'll go back to Garcin's trailer in the suburbs of Seattle. We'll get a phone call that's a signal for meeting nearby for our target information. Please leave your message after the tone. Hello, Mr. Smith. The election is drawing near. Have you decided on your vote? If you haven't, please let the Republic Party make the most of your precious vote. Thank you and have a nice day. At the back of this trailer, there's some screen behind the door that we can't currently access. To say this built intrigue of what was going on behind these doors is a bit of an understatement. In Harmon's room will be Harmon and Samantha. When Harmon is awake, she's his maid and treats him well. The master is awake. Garcian, relax. As you wish, master. And when he's not awake, she takes advantage of him in more ways than one. Here! Come on! It's really good. Open your mouth. Ah, 
Eat, oh. damn it! Oh. oh, I didn't notice you there. No need to be so reserved, you know. Don't worry about him. The scruff loves to play rough. Ah, <sighs> <sighs> oh, that felt good. Talk about relieving stress. Hey, you! What are you staring at? <laughs> oh, I get it. You want to take a look, right? <laughs> Does it turn you on? Huh? Does it? Hey, will you stop staring? <clears throat> Jeez, what a pervert. So going through some of this extra material, she at one point was an assassin that killed all the Killer 7 before Harmon killed her and made her a servant. One of the highlights of Killer 7 is Target 2, Cloud Man. Gameplay wise, there's nothing too memorable about this level, but the narrative driven by the target, Andre Almeida, makes an unforgettable experience. Instead of in-engine cutscenes, we get animated cutscenes here with people speaking about Andre Almeida. Looking for Almeida, hmm? I couldn't care less about that disco freak. I won't have anything to do with him. Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm glad the town has flourished, but do you have any idea how many creeps with that weird smile have moved in? Something's up with him. Although I don't quite know what. This is an old town, and we respect tradition. I can't get along with a bunch of newcomers who just waltzed on in. No way! This section also has one of the game's better puzzles, the billboards and having the quiz, having to pay attention to these facts. And as mentioned earlier, there is great use of combat navigation with the maze of trailers to try and get around him for a clear shot. But one shot is all you need. The game doesn't make use of this elsewhere, unfortunately. Clements, you're in control of things now. Walk down the path of life. Don't succumb to weakness. Take the big risks. Our third target is Curtis, and this is a more personal story as he has a history with Dan. He's an incredibly despicable character involved in organ trafficking of girls. Ask yourself, Pedro, how many children have you killed? Mary? You mean your little girl, Mary? Mary, where is she? Ah, right here. The first part on the fairgrounds has a missed opportunity with the maze. The section easily could have had something like the Andre fight where you can navigate around to get the drop on an enemy. While most areas are fairly linear, the section Curtis's house does loop back onto itself and something I wish the game made a bit more use of. The fight against Curtis is one of the game's highlights. It's a one on one duel using only Dan. As I said earlier, I do wish we had more of these kind of moments with some of the other smiths. Something that's more personal. Looks like this is your end. Oh, guess you think this is pretty funny. You got quite a hobby here, old man. Doesn't hurt to have a hobby after retirement. What do you think? What do I think? I think what you got here is no different than what those guys do at immigration. All I ever wanted was to shed light on my life. You have no idea. You're nothing but a sick maniac. Guess it's time to close the curtains. Trying to die in style? Give me a break, you sick old man. Target 4, Alter Ego, takes us to the Dominican Republic to deal with the Handsome Man and its artist. We are the Punishing Rangers, the Handsome Man! It 
it's the game's tropical, or holiday level. This section I found a bit more frustrating. You have to go find all the locations that Iwazaro is located to collect the color samples to unlock the gate. I ran into the classic case of find all of them except one and had to backtrack. At least there are teleporting shortcuts here to shorten that backtracking. We have an 8 on 8 showdown with the handsome men, which ends up being a narrative fight. Each fight is already predetermined. <laughs> Target 5, Smile, is where Killer7 really takes an interesting turn narrative-wise and becomes a more personal story involving Garcian. Up until now, we haven't been playing as Garcian that much. Despite being a presence in most cutscenes, the focus hasn't been on him. This has now shifted. Samantha is now dead in the trailer and we can enter one of the two locked doors in the trailer to see what Harmon and Kun Lao are up to. <laughs> 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 this then takes us to the Union Hotel in Philadelphia. Now, there are some issues here in regards to the pacing, which up until now has been excellent. We end up making two trips to this location. In between, we'll have a trip to Coburn National Elementary School. I think Killer7 would have been better off just dropping this part, go right to the school section, and then have us visit the hotel afterwards. Because with a few narrative adjustments, they could have just had us visiting the hotel once, and I feel that would have been the better choice pacing-wise. Ever play Thief 2? It somewhat reminds me of the two missions Casing the Joint and Masks. One time you go through the area, Casing the Joint, and then come back the next mission to do the rest. I always was puzzled by this design decision and wish they kept it as just one mission. Revisiting a level can be a really effective tool in how you approach a narrative, but here I don't feel that they pulled it off. The Coburn National Elementary School section of this target is fantastic. It has a great puzzle that requires a bit more thought to put together. A mere park rinder, this mysterious individual that those letters have been sent to with the pigeons, gets the main focus here. There are audio logs throughout to piece together more about Amir. One of the best scenes in the game happens here with Garcian playing Russian Roulette. <laughs> Sorry. But a deal's a deal. <sighs> this gun holds seven bullets. I'm a professional. You can't fool me, old man. You and I, we're both sick. The only time we feel alive is when we put our lives on the line. It's a sad reality. But we people are never satisfied. We'll always seek a higher rush. The history of the United States rests within the walls of this institution. It's an old tradition that has continued since the first presidential election. I want you to see it through to the end. And by the way, women are all the same. There's a great narrative boss fight to cap off this section. A golden gun is dropped, but none of the smiths can use it to kill off these heaven smiles, and we're killed off one by one. until Garstian is the last one left, and he can make use of the golden gun. With that, we head back to the hotel where the truth is revealed, that Garstian himself is a mere park runner, and he killed off the Killer 7 many years ago.
No, it wasn't me. It, it can't be. It, it's all a misunderstanding. game's epilogue, which takes place three years later, we are now playing as Amir. We're given the choice that will lead to the United States or Japan defeating the other. And there's one final smile to deal with, who's located in the trailer in the other door that's now unlocked. However, after the credits, we cut to a hundred years in the future, where Harmon and Kunlan are once again having their fight against one another. Whatever choice you made earlier, the end result is the same. These two will likely continue to fight each other until the end of time, in their game of chess, both figuratively and literally. You're awake from your nightmare. Harmon. The world will change. All it does is turn. Now, let's dance. <laughs> and that is Killer7 in a nutshell. Again, I just gave a brief overview of the happenings. There's plenty more here, and there's plenty of aspects that are open-ended that fans have been debated since the game came out. And to be honest, there's many aspects that I don't fully understand about it, but that's also the joy of Killer7. Pulling off a story that's full of open-endedness and up to interpretation is no small feat, but soon and his team were up to the task and do so wonderfully. And it's through Killer7 that Grasshopper Manufacturer and Suda51 became known to the gaming world at large. While it didn't have huge sales numbers, Killer7 would go on to have a very strong follow. The studio would go on to find more commercial success with titles like No More Heroes and Lollipop Chainsaw. I have to note, of all the titles that get a remake, Lollipop Chainsaw getting one as opposed to a remaster is something that still puzzles me. And these are all great titles, and I do plan on covering them someday, but none of them quite hit like Killer7 does. It's not for everyone, and it never tries to be. It's funny that Suda51 is team one to developing Killer7 with the intention to be more mainstream title, one with a worldwide release, and this is what we ended up with. Again, it's a miracle that even during a time frame when studios were still okay with taking risks, that they took a risk on Killer7, which I'm so glad they did. Thanks for watching. If you haven't done so already, do all those things the YouTube algorithm likes. If you'd like to support the channel further, please consider joining my Patreon or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks everyone. Boulder Punch out. This is a lost city. You must find the key. For your tranquility within guide to your soul find your place then you'll find your way and if i don't <laughs> the darkness will swallow you